So SpongeBob SquarePants The Cosmic Shake was finally released a few weeks ago. For me, this game was highly anticipated because this is the first 3D SpongeBob game that actually looked fun to play since the SpongeBob movie video game released all the way back in 2004. This game is a sequel to Battle for Bikini Bottom Rehydrated, this time with all new levels and a unique story to play along with. But the thing is, the SpongeBob SquarePants speedrunning community is huge, and it didn't take long at all for speedrunners to start breaking the game. And even though the game is so new, I actually think the speedrun route is in a pretty good place right now, and barring any new massive sequence break discoveries, I'm somewhat confident that this video won't be completely out of date after release, but who really knows. The game opens up with Spongebob waking up in his pineapple, preparing for a fun day at Glove World with Patrick. The beginning of this game is just a tutorial, but we do have to go through it for two reasons. The first is that compared to Battle for Bikini Bottom, this game is very linear. In Battle for Bikini Bottom, the only task that is mandatory in that game is collecting enough shiny objects for the first golden spatula. Once that's done, you can visit any area in the game and do any challenge in any order you want, provided you have enough golden spatulas to enter each level. But in this game, there are no golden spatulas. Instead, there are these doubloons that you can find hidden in levels, or you acquire them after completing a skill challenge. But these aren't required for level completion, and we can beat the game without collecting a single one. The other reason why this tutorial is so important is because Spongebob starts out this game with having no abilities whatsoever. The only thing he can do is jump, walk, and interact with other characters. All abilities in this game require hitting certain triggers in order to unlock them. So after we get done speaking to Sandy and walk on this patch of sand, Spongebob will unlock his spin attack. Something else I should also mention is that I have a certain number of rebinds on my controller, which makes tech smashing way easier. On my left trigger, I have E-Bound, which allows me to interact with NPCs, so I'll usually mash that when approaching somebody to talk to them as quickly as possible, and then my right trigger is bound to space, and I'll use that plus the A button to mash quickly through dialogue. I just wanted to point that out in case someone tried copying my button inputs, because this will not work unless you do the exact same rebinds. Anyways, once we get to Patrick's Rock, the duo will then head to Glove World. While at Glove World, a wagon magically appears out of thin air. After perusing through its wares, Spongebob locks his eyes on a glowing container of bubble soap, and we are introduced to Madame Cassandra, a mermaid fortune teller who gives them the magic bubble soap, telling them they can use it to make their friends' dreams come true. Afterwards, Spongebob begins blowing a bunch of bubbles and grants a bunch of wishes for the citizens of Bikini Bottom. After blowing all the bubbles, they decide to read the back of the label to learn that this bubble soap actually belonged to King Neptune and isn't meant to be used by mortals. This causes, well, a cosmic shake. A giant portal opens up, sucking up most of Bikini Bottom, taking buildings and residents with it, leaving the town covered in a substance called cosmic jelly, the building blocks of reality. After waking up in a post-apocalyptic Bikini Bottom, Patrick is turned into a balloon, serving as our companion for the rest of the game, floating by our side as we only get to play as Spongebob in this game. We'll continue heading through Bikini Bottom, doing some platforming sections where we learn how to ground pound and learn how to hover with a pizza box. An important aspect to platforming in this game is learning how to utilize spins. By spinning during the apex of jumps, make Spongebob stall in the air for a bit, allowing for longer jumps. Gliding is relatively slow and will need to be avoided as much as possible. But by starting and gliding canceling it, gives Spongebob a different falling animation, where he falls a bit more forward than usual, which you can see me using across these gaps to avoid ledge grabs and pulling out the pizza box. Eventually, we'll be confronted by some enemies made out of cosmic jelly that were created after the cosmic shake. These enemies are just grunts and are taken out pretty easily. We'll then talk to Madame Cassandra, who will give us outfits to travel to different universes to find our friends and collect cosmic jelly for her along the way. This is pretty much all of the story I wanted to explain to at least give some context as to why we're jumping into portals, going to random areas, but for the rest of the video, I'm mainly just going to be focusing on the speedrun. But before we get into the first level, I'd like to give a special thanks to today's video sponsor, Raycon. If you're looking for an affordable, durable pair of earbuds for any occasion, Raycon has you covered. Whether I'm going on a walk, working out at the gym, or trying to drown out noises when I'm sleeping, having a comfortable pair of earbuds with good sound quality is crucial which is why I love Raycon. I'm not even a massive fan of earbuds, mainly because most always seem to fall out of my ears when I'm working out, but when I took my Raycons to my latest session, I was pleasantly surprised I didn't have to worry about them coming loose even once. Raycons also have 32 hours of standby battery life and can play audio for eight hours of continuous use. These earbuds are sweat and water resistant, allowing them to survive sweaty pockets or the occasional washing machine experience in the event you forget them in your pockets. If you're ready to buy something small with a big impact, 
Click the link in the description or go to buyraycon.com slash easyescapespeedruns to get 15% off your Raycon purchase. Thanks again to Raycon for sponsoring me. Now let's get back into the video. The first level we'll be heading to is a western level in Jellyfish Fields. We start at this level immediately riding the seahorse. At this point we haven't learned how to properly ride them yet and are kind of just locked into being able to move left and right with the seahorse. But by holding left when moving down this ramp will cause a massive speed boost for some reason allowing us to get to the bottom quicker and that will be it for the seahorse section. So yeah, like the title says, this game is pretty broken and we're finally going to see the first case of why this is. In this game, certain animations don't play out, the character models aren't on screen. For example, this jelly maker enemy that spawns jelly bandits won't finish its death animation if it isn't on screen. And pretty much every enemy in the game won't approach and attack Spongebob if he isn't on screen either, which will be abused later on, but that's not the point of why I'm telling you this. Apparently there's a massive oversight, and this mechanic also applies to animations that Spongebob does, including his ground pound. Meaning if we perform a ground pound when Spongebob isn't visible, it never ends allowing him to float in the air from location to location. There is an example out there of someone pulling this off while keeping Spongebob on camera, but I'm showing this off just so you can see what's going on while this exploit is being used. So for the standard setup to pull this trick off requires turning the camera all the way up until it stops moving and then doing a short hop plus a ground pound. The jump has to be super short though, otherwise the camera will see Spongebob. Generally, this is a pretty inconsistent way of doing the trick because sometimes the camera will pan down earlier than other attempts, cutting the glide off early, which is why I recommend performing a walk-off float instead. By walking off a ledge with the camera pulled up and spamming the ground pound button makes it so a ground pound is performed as soon as Spongebob walks off the ledge and removes the need for quick inputs or any type of setup other than positioning the camera where you want to go. The last thing I want to mention about floats for now is that if runners aren't confident they're in their correct location when landing, they can press start, swap to a different costume, and then when they unpause, they'll get their jump back plus the ability to glide. This does lose time, but it does help out a lot with consistency. There is more float stuff to talk about later, but for now, let's get back into the run. So after skipping the cutscene, the first float I'll do is towards this trampoline. Since during floats I can only look at the sky, I have different visual and audio cues I use to know when to land. For this one there are jelly fragments hovering above the trampoline, so once I hear Spongebob collect them, I can hold back and land right on it, placing me right on the ledge. Afterwards I'll do some platforming, and then position myself for another float to go straight towards the next seahorse section. Normally we have to go to Manta Fey and get our seahorse license, do a battle in the saloon, and then do a bar mini game. But luckily for us, all that's required to ride the seahorse is landing on this trigger. When riding the seahorse, I pretty much just spam boost and jump because jumping maintains the speed you get from the boost, and then I reinitiate the boost each time I land. Following this, we're supposed to help Mr. Krabs out with the first round of collecting cactus juice. But even in the pre release version of the game, speedrunners were running before the game officially came out, and out of bounds skip was found to skip this. But of course, why do all that when we could just float over instead? For this float, I just aim SpongeBob lining up at the top of his cowboy hat right towards where the first cactus spawns. And then when I finally see the cliffs appear at the bottom of the screen, I'll let go. After milking this cactus, the nearby lift will activate, and you can see me go for a ledge grab here that doesn't pay off, but I do manage to get the backup strap by jumping off this wanted poster, barely saving any time. It may not look like much, but little tricks like this can save upwards of 5 seconds alone. After milking the third cactus, I'll skip the next lift by doing a precisely timed double jump for max height to get a ledge grab on this beam, and then make my way around the scaffolding and beeline to the barrel to deposit all the juice. Just as I arrive to the barrel, a bunch of enemies will spawn, and we are introduced to two new enemies, the Tartar Jelly and the Jelly Maker. The Jelly Maker spawns Jelly Bandits, and needs to be taken out as soon as possible. Each time I hit one, it pushes Spongebob back with a roar, but this can be avoided by dodging, which as you'll see later on, has a ton of invisibility frames for pretty much the entire duration of the roll. Like I mentioned earlier, I'll keep the camera focused on the Jelly Maker, otherwise it won't finish its death animation, and by doing this, I can also prevent the Tartar Jelly from activating. Afterwards, I'll load up the barrel and get sent to the den of the Alaskan Bullworm. In order to activate the lift to escape this cave, we have to find Old Man Jenkins' Lost Gold Tooth, so I'll drop down and collect the tooth hidden in this rock. This spawns a bunch of enemies, which normally takes quite a bit of time to deal with, but we can skip this encounter by abusing the game's autosave feature. The trigger for the autosave isn't fully understood, but if I let the enemies kill Spongebob while he has 3 underwear, in most cases the autosave will activate during the death animation, and then we can reload the save file to spawn back near Old Man Jenkins, skipping the fight entirely. 
After riding the lift, we'll have another seahorse section. And there isn't too much to this, but by abusing the speed conservation and cutting corners, I can clip into the train, which is kind of cool. Once I get onto the train, it's a straight shot to the end, and the main optimization here is rolling as much as possible. You've probably noticed I tend to jump out of all of my rolls, and this is done on purpose, because Spongebob's velocity when running is normally at a value of 900, but when he rolls, it instantly shoots up to 1385. However, the problem with rolls is that after they end, his speed drops all the way down to 400, and then climbs back up to 900 again. But by jumping out of a roll, you can cancel the speed drop, and Spongebob's speed just slowly decelerates back to normal run speed. After reaching the end of the train marks the end of the western level, and we get transported back to the hub world. There isn't too much to point out during the hub world sections, they're pretty much just littered with random tasks like pressing a button, collecting some books, flipping patties, or picking up trash. Unlike when we're in the other levels, where if you're able to reach a destination early, we can skip certain checkpoints, in the hub location, all checkpoints have to be completed to get access to the next level. So yeah, not much interesting stuff happens during these, so I'm just going to skip over them, and for the rest of the video, just go level to level. The next level is a film set for a karate movie, with Squidward as the director, and Sandy as the final boss. This is personally my favorite level, but it has one of the most difficult tricks in the speedrun. After walking through the hallway and skipping through Pearl's dialogue, I'll platform around this cardboard from the set to get onto this platform. I'll then do a roll off the ledge, instantly cancel it with a spin to not only maintain my speed coming off the ledge, but also keep my double jump, then I'll jump, spin, and jump spin again to make it over the fence. This avoids a dialogue trigger, and if I hug the wall, I can also avoid an encounter with enemies. I'll then climb up this beam and position the camera behind Spongebob to perform a new type of float that I'll just call wall floats. How these work are instead of pointing the camera up to get Spongebob off screen, I'll just use a wall instead. The benefit of doing this is I'm able to get a lot more height from jumps before performing the float, since if I were to try to do that with the camera up, Spongebob would be in view, but not in this case. And this jump is very necessary because it gives me enough height to float onto the sledge. I'll then platform around some invisible barriers, do another wall glide, land on this building, grab an invisible ledge, and then finally land on this cardboard wall. Normally this is supposed to be an auto-scroller section, but instead I can walk on top of the wall to avoid it completely. Once I get most of the way down the wall, well, you can probably guess at this point, I'm gonna do another float. This one is really important because by talking to Squidward over here, we learn a new ability called the Karate Kick. This ability is one of the most crucial as it allows us to fly towards enemies and interactable objects at high speeds and certain speed tech just isn't possible without it. In terms of speedrunning, this is probably the coolest ability in the game. Afterwards, I'll platform around the buildings again to get myself out of bounds, and then fly towards a dojo. I have to be really careful during this float, as there's a giant death plane all around this area. After I land, I'll need to start making my way up to the dojo rooftop by climbing up the downtown area. Luckily, most of the windows and objects sticking out of the buildings are able to be platformed on, so I'll abuse this to continue gaining height until I finally end up on this building here. Then I'm going to set up for the most difficult trick in this level. For this, I'll do a walk-off float and fly across this massive gap until I reach this building on the other side. The only problem is we don't have enough height to land on top of it. I'll look for this panel sticking out of the building to know when to land, and then just barely land on this window. I'll then need to do this really tricky jump to land on this pipe, throw a bubble at the button to lower the crane, and then kick a nearby enemy to get the rest of the way up. The rest of the level is pretty straightforward from here, I'll just need to keep climbing up these cranes until I reach the top of the dojo and press the button. For the Sandy boss fight, I'll start out by making her hit these explosives to stun her, and then once she lands on the ground, hit her with a karate kick. After this, she'll spawn a wave of enemies, including these ninjellies, that will charge after Spongebob and can only be defeated after being stunned from running into a wall or being hit with a karate kick. I like to go for this strat here where I stand in the center and try to get them all to hit this tree to knock them all out at once, which is really satisfying to pull off. I also want to be only 2 health by this point, because after finishing this wave of enemies, Sandy will flip the wheel on its side and begin charging at Spongebob, but I'll just die here on purpose to skip the phase completely. The rest of the fight is straightforward, and I'll just need to hit her 2 more times to finish it, and that's pretty much it. Next we'll be heading into a pirate themed version of Goo Lagoon. This level is by far one of the most broken levels of the speedrun in terms of skips, one of the most frustrating in terms of RNG, and one of the most interesting to route the game around because of how many abilities get skipped. You see in this level, normally we're supposed to free Larry to learn how to use a hook swing, but we skip it and can't use it for the entire game. 
This is the same case for these rings that when glided through, give Spongebob a speed boost. But by never talking to Mr. Krabs at the top of the sandcastle, they just don't spawn in for the rest of the game. And finally, we're also supposed to learn how to slingshot from this mermaid. But yeah, it gets skipped. So let me show you why. I'll first start by making my way across the beach using some of the jelly bandits to boost off of. When I say this level is terrible in terms of RNG, do you guys remember the dying for pie episode from Spongebob with the pies that are bombs? Well, yeah. All throughout this level, pies are being thrown at you at all times. As I get towards the end of the beach, I'll jump off this palm tree and glide around a cutscene trigger. This can be really scary to go for, not because it's difficult, but because you can get pied right into the cutscene if you're unlucky, losing roughly a minute, killing most runs. Assuming this didn't happen, I'll climb up the rocks and then float towards an island in the background that you're not even supposed to be on. I can then jump up this island, make my way to this palm tree, and then aim my camera towards the ship. This ship is the last area of the level, which means once I get there, I've pretty much done a full level skip. As I see my float getting close to the ship, I'll move right and land on it, and then do the prawn boss fight, which is just three waves of jelly enemies. There are two new types of enemies here. The first is this cube jelly that does a body slam attack after hovering over Spongebob for long enough. The next are these enemies called baby booms that shoot a ball of jelly at you, which can be deflected back to do damage back to them. I can exploit this on the final wave of enemies by positioning myself in front of this big jelly, making him get hit by the ball, and then I can kick a jelly bandit behind the big jelly, stunning him, giving me two free hits. I'll then clear out the rest of the enemies, and that concludes the pirate level. Next up is a Halloween themed rock bottom level. Theoretically, we would also be able to do an end of level skip in this level, but it currently isn't possible, and I'll shortly explain why that is, but first I'll need to make my way through some of the level. Along the way, I'll be introduced to these new enemies, which Patrick calls Spludges, so that's just what I'll call them. Spludges can't be killed with normal attacks, and first requires learning an ability called Spook. So after passing this group of Spludges, I'll float towards these rocks, and by hitting the wall means I'll be close enough to hit the trigger to unlock Spook, then I'll warp back to the start of the level. From here I'll head left and then initiate another float. For this one I usually guide myself using this pipe, and then once I get far enough past the rock to the left, I drop down and end up on the outside portion of the museum that's at the end of the level. From here we can actually see and explore the Gary boss fight from the outside. But unfortunately there's no way to get inside, as clipping in this game seems pretty rare, if even possible at all. Also the trigger to enter the boss room is in the first part of the museum, so there doesn't seem to be any chance that it's leaking out somewhere. This is why instead we drop down near the first part of the museum and run to this corner which triggers the checkpoint, allowing us to warp inside. From here there will be a group of four spludges, and they need to be taken out in order to turn on this button, and then after pressing the button, the door to the boss fight will open up. For the Gary fight, we need to climb each story of the boss room and hit the vending machine on each level. Normally we need to run past enemies and Gary's attacks along the way, but for the second vending machine, I can either death abuse to skip to the top of the staircase, which causes an invisible floor to appear, and I can run across it, or just jump from this railing to go straight to the vending machine. The invisible floor strat is only worth doing if you have one health, otherwise the railing seems to be faster overall. For the third vending machine, I'll just perform a float and glide over to it, and after hitting it marks the end of the rock bottom level. Next up is a prehistoric kelp forest level, and just like the previous two levels, of course there's an end of level skip for it. We'll start out by running through the first cave until we reach this bed of bones that drops into a slide. I'll ride the slide down until I hit the first turn and then jump off the slide. If I time it jumps correctly and aims slightly left, I should be able to jump over the death plane and land out of bounds. Then as you could probably guess, from here I do a float. This float is a bit trickier than others because the visual cues are a lot less clear, but with a bit of practice, I managed to get it down. I'll follow along the forest until it clears out, letting me know it's safe to land. From here I'll travel out of bounds until I reach this tree, and then clip and bounce enough to trigger a cutscene. Then there's this puzzle we have to do moving these rock pillars into the correct pattern. But the rocks always start in the same spot, and the solution is always the same. This puzzle is necessary to complete, since once we complete it, we get sent straight to the pearl... Um... I mean, pom pom boss fight. This boss fight has some of the most difficult strategies of the entire run zero of which I use, but I will cover all of them anyways. For this boss, you're normally meant to evade attacks from Pom Pom and the jelly enemies that spawn, and then after each wave of attacks, rock platforms will drop down, allowing you to hit each of the bones sticking out. The thing is, these bones can be hit regardless of the rocks dropping down, but getting the perfect jumps for them is really, really difficult. In practice, I've hit this blue bone about 10 times, 
I've only hit the yellow bone twice, and I've yet to hit the purple one once. It didn't take me long to realize that this wouldn't be viable for me to do in runs, so I just stopped practicing it altogether. There is an alternative strat that is less difficult execution wise, but is very risky to perform because messing it up results in losing the entire run. How it works is after hitting the first bone, you get Spongebob to 1 HP. As the third ring approaches Spongebob, you can jump into the lava. If Spongebob dies at the same time the rocks drop, they kind of just stay there and never go away. You can see Acrid do this in his run, which isn't faster than doing the other bone strats, but in a way is more consistent. The problem is, if you mess it up, you'd be forced to start the fight over from scratch. There's a variation of this trick that involves hitting a bone as the rocks drop, and then dying, which not only gives the same effect, but you don't lose any progress from the fight. But this does seem risky, as if you do miss the timing, or miss the bone, you lose any benefits the trick grants. Being able to perform even two of these bone strats can save 25 seconds or more during the fight. The second half of the pom pom fight doesn't have any strats like this, since the bones you hit are stored underneath her platform, under the lava, and aren't active until they're revealed. Once the last bone is hit, marks the end of the fight, and the end of the prehistoric level. Next up is a medieval themed level in the sulfur fields. This is probably the second most difficult level, mainly because like I said earlier, we skipped a ton of abilities in the pirate level, and the hookshot, rings, and slingshot are all normally needed here. So here's how I'll get around it. The first jump can be reached without needing the rings activated. But for the second one, I'll need to do a new type of float called a trampoline float. After jumping on a trampoline, I'll turn the camera all the way up, spin, double jump, spin again, and then glide. As long as Spongebob is out of view, I can press ground pound out of the glide to switch to a float and clear the gap. I'll continue along the slide until I reach this bubble board. While riding it, I'll head directly upright at an angle and travel towards this balloon. This is a bit trickier than it looks as there's a massive death plane to the right of me, so I'll need to harshly cut the corner around it and then keep glide canceling until I reach the slide. Then I'll hop around the slide to go straight to the end. Normally here I need to press some panels to make my way down to this tower. But if I jump off each section in reverse, I can still make it to each platform. The only reason for hitting these panels is to remove the death plane underneath because this area in the game is littered with them. Maybe once we have proper tools allowing us to see death planes, some new strats will be found to maneuver around them easier. But for now, this is how it's done. Eventually I'll reach a slide, and as I reach this bend, I'll jump off the slide and land right at the end. From here we're normally supposed to use a slingshot to head to the garden and traverse through a maze. But of course, instead I can just float with Spongebob to skip a whole bunch of stuff and go straight to the castle courtyard. Luckily for us, as long as we walk into Squidward's trigger, we can just fast forward to the spot in the level. Again, in a lot of ways this game is kind of a baby game, so we have to do this... I don't even know what you want to call it, I guess a puzzle? A challenge? Because it's not really puzzling or challenging. But yeah, as long as I get at least 12 of these button presses correct, the castle doors will open up and I can head inside. Before I move on, I do want to give an update to this level and say that a skip straight to the castle from the start of the level is now finally possible, and this strat is used in the now former world record by Tyron18. This is done by setting up a trampoline float with a trampoline just before the bubble board. He floats way out around the death barrier, and then after falling for a certain amount of time, does a costume switch giving him the ability to glide, and uses quick A presses to glide stall his way over to the castle. From here it's just a simple glide to talk to Squidward. Anyways, while in the castle, I'll climb the tiki's to the left and float towards these mattresses. I'll do a costume swap to get my jump back, allowing me to kick this enemy. From here I'll need to climb up to get some height, so I can float all the way to the doors to the inner castle to bypass the hookshot requirement. After I get to the end, I'll have a boss fight versus Twitchy. This is by far the most annoying boss fight of the entire run, but recently there have been some new strat discoveries that have made it way more consistent. How this fight works is you need to place cakes on each empty plate in the dining hall, all while avoiding enemies and Twitchy's green ball attacks. So after plating the back row, I'll turn my camera so that the camera never focuses on most of the spawned in enemies, allowing me to do the fight with relative ease. It's actually pretty funny if you move to the back of the room after completing the fight, because you can just see a massive pileup of all the enemies that are spawned in that are just waiting to attack Spongebob. Following Medieval is the final level of the game, Glove World. Normally in this level, we need to make our way through the amusement park, completing a handful of checkpoints like the Tunnel of Glove and the Glove World Jail. But as you could probably guess, the float just bypasses all of it. For most of this level, I'll pretty much just be floating across goo, hitting required checkpoints like unlocking the reef blower, and avoiding cutscene triggers. 
Eventually I'll get to the section where I need to ride this bubble board through some moving pillars, which did get a little too close for comfort, but luckily I got through unscathed. Afterwards, I'll just need to ride this ferris wheel to the top and head into the glovey glove boss fight. For this boss fight, I'll start it by hitting two of these cube jellies, and once I kill them, Glovey will begin shooting jelly at me, and these big jellies will spawn in. I'll move in a certain way to lure them into the jelly here, which is a much faster way of killing them. Following this, I'll need to go through three phases of using this reef blower to absorb enemies to shoot Glovey. Once I get to the third phase of this fight, I'll need to jump on the other side of this glove and float over to this platform to start the boss fight, since I won't be able to use a ring to cross a gap. Over the course of this final phase, Glovey will begin throwing some piles of trash at us, and we'll suck that trash up with a reef blower and use it to do the final hit to Glovey, finishing the level. After Glove World, I'll have to do another weird side task in Bikini Bottom, picking up some trash. To do this quickly, I'll set up the round trash to be completed in one go by placing it on the platform, and then while waiting for the next cycle, pick up the cube-shaped trash and walk to the side of the garbage truck to clip the trash into it. Once this is done, it will be revealed to us that the bubble soap Cassandra gave us at the beginning of the game was stolen from King Neptune, all in order to force Spongebob to help her collect cosmic jelly. Amidst this, Squidward comes into the frame to lecture Spongebob, but is then fused with cosmic jelly by Cassandra to create a mutated Squidward for the final boss. For this fight, Squidward will slam on the ground, creating waves of cosmic dust that I'll need to avoid. I'll start out this fight by positioning myself onto the chair, allowing me to avoid the first wave of attacks. I'll then wait for Squidward to retract his tentacles, and then jump out to hit Cassandra. Normally during this fight, you're supposed to use a reef blower to suck up enemies and hit Cassandra, but not only does this little trick save a bit of time, if timed perfectly, the game glitches and allows us to use a reef blower during the stomp attacks to remove enemies out of the way. The only problem is, you have to hit her immediately after she spawns, not anytime sooner, otherwise the boss will softlock. In this case, I was a little bit off on my attack and didn't get the reef blower, which wasn't a huge deal, but it just means I would have to jump off again for any additional attacks or use the reef blower for the rest of the fight. This fight was apparently a scrap boss fight from Battle for Bikini Bottom, which is actually pretty cool that we finally got to see it flushed out, but after doing the third hit to Cassandra, the game just ends, which is super weird because these games usually tend to have very theatrical final bosses. But yeah. Overall, I really enjoyed this game, but I would have to give it a 7 out of 10 instead of anything higher, because outside of the Sandy and Pom Pom boss fights, the fights were just too easy and kind of felt underwhelming. But I think the levels and story were really enjoyable to play through, and graphically the game looks great. I ended my run with a 44-44.20, which was faster than my goal time of 45, but I still feel like I could have shaven a couple more minutes off. Unfortunately, this just wasn't my favorite game to replay over and over again, especially since it was pretty much just a float simulator, but I still had a lot of fun running the game, learning the route, and glitch hunting. If you guys want to see an even more optimized speedrun of this game, I'd recommend taking a look at the leaderboards and watching over any of the now 3 sub-40 speedruns. There's a pretty tight competition for first place, and it will be interesting to see where this game is in a year from now. But still, it is pretty impressive that in only under a month, the game is already shorter than Battle for Bikini Bottom. Anyways guys, that's all I have to say for today's video. If you enjoyed, be sure to leave a like, and make sure you subscribe for more speedrunning related content. Special thanks again to Raycon for sponsoring this video. Again, you guys can go to buyraycon.com slash speedruns to get 15% off your order. Thanks again for watching, and as always, I hope you all have a beautiful life.